Good morning, good morning. Different car. Oh, I'm running late because I had to change over the blooming holder and everything. It's uh, Friday the 31st of March. It's a lovely sunny day in paradise. We like that. It's also payday. We do not like that. Actually, we don't mind it. It's sort of uh, got some money in the bank this month. Last month was very, very tight, very tight. Oh, ho, ho. I was down to 700 pounds. Actually, I was down to 200 pounds at one point in the bank and I don't, I don't run an overdraft. So, last time I thought I was gonna go overdrawn, I rang up the bank. My father was a bank manager and my father said to me, you know, uh, banks, he said, banks, all we wanna just be kept in the loop. He said, you know, if you're in financial trouble, he said, people just clam up, they don't say anything and, and, uh, and uh, what, or you should just ring us up and say, look, you know, I need a bit of money to get me through the month or something, you know. <laughs> And uh, of course he was, you know, he was born in 1928, so the sort of banking he was into is not at all the sort of banking. I mean, they didn't have like uh, credit checks and Experian and all that, you know, one black mark, just because you were two days late with your mortgage 10 years ago, and um, that now means you can't buy a settee from DFS. Oh, didn't have any of that. So uh, anyway, so I rang the bank manager up and I said, look, just to let you know, there's, there's a small possibility I'm gonna go overdrawn. But I'm got, I've already put the money in, you know, but thanks to you, Grovel Grovel, it's gonna take three days to get into my effing account. But Grovel Grovel, so sorry and all that, you know, for running out of my money. And uh, and he said, oh, no, I haven't even, oh, he says it hasn't come up on my report yet, you know. He has a report of serious delinquents and, you know, just someone who's 200 pound overdrawn for a day is not, doesn't come up on his radar. So I stabbed myself in the foot there, didn't I? I told him I was going overdrawn and in the end I didn't even do it and it didn't even matter because I had the money anyway. <sighs> so, what's going on? What's going on? There's two dental stories. Oh, dentists are going to get a 1% pay rise. NHS in England, 1% pay rise. And about the same everywhere else. I mean, it's not that. I mean, you know, the old Scots tried to pay their dentists a decent salary, didn't they? And then and then sort of you know they've gone they've they've they're as tight in the public sector now as we are although traditionally they've always been a lot looser you know in terms of monetary policy so one percent i mean what are you going to do with one percent i mean one percent is sort of naught percent isn't it really and with inflation running at two or three percent then that's 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 a pay decrease isn't it what they're saying is we don't want to keep your pay up with the cost of things we we want you to uh, cut back on, on what you buy or what you earn. You know, a ratchet. And, uh, yeah, and they've changed the uh, retail price index again. They, they, we used to have a thing called the retail price index, and it was supposed to be the price of a basket of goods that was sort of representative of what people bought. And then um, the government didn't like that because uh, what they did was they discovered that their thing called the consumer's price index would be lower. And the reason why it's lower is that they excluded housing costs out of the consumer price index. And um, they said, oh no, we, we're gonna go over to the CPI because it's more harmonious in the European sense because the cost of uh, housing varies so much across Europe. I mean, for example, in England, we're a nation of owner occupiers. You know, we buy our house, we've all got mortgages. Whereas in France, for example, they all lease. They've got like a few, like one person owns all the property in France and nobody else owns anything. They all just lease or rent. And how can you compare that? How can you compare a mortgage payment with a lease payment? So, um, so, and oh, and by the way, the CPI is less than the RPI, which is quite convenient for us because we use the index indicator to set uh, wage, uh, to set pensions and things like that and the unions use it to try and sort of work out how much they want in terms of pay rise and going on strike and everything. So we'd like a lower index, thank you very much. So now they've now decided that uh, housing shouldn't be excluded because housing is a major cost. Now of course the average house costs seven times the average income, family income. A lot of people it used to be like you spent a third of your wages on your housing. Now it's like two thirds. You know, it's not. It's a half. It's not less than a half. 
is all is spent now on housing. And so they're like, well, how can you not have, a, have an index that doesn't include this massive increase? So they've come out now with the Consumer Price Index H, H, which H is for housing. So they've added it back on again. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, actually we've decided that um, we, should, uh, we should have housing in there. So what are you gonna do? So now we've got three. We've got the RPI, we've got, uh, we've got, uh, you know, and, and the critics of the RPI say, oh, well, no, it's absolutely useless because, uh, you know, like, you might have like an oil shock in one month and then, and then in that month, the re retail price index will be 10%. But then next, next month it'll go down to two. So really it's all over the place. But in fact, it's, uh, you know, prices are all over the place. They do, they don't just go up constantly like tiny bit fraction every month they they push you know they have a push and then they stop for a while then they have a push then they stop for a while so I still like the RPI the RPI the dentists used to have their wages set you know with reference to um, annual average earnings we used to be in the top decile the top that was our niche like not 9% not 11% but 10% of average earnings um, you know, like in the in the top ten percent of earners, you know. So they, they all the earners, bell curve, uh, Poisson distribution, and uh, cut out the bottom ninety percent, and that's where we were. But they soon they put a stop to that because they said nobody has a right, nobody has a right to be anywhere in that scale. And uh, you know, so so what makes you think that we're going to fix you in the top ten percent of earners, like, like number ten? And um, whereas in fact, we weren't actually demanding a right to be in the scale, it was just a yardstick. It was just like bearing in mind the financial risk, the, c the commercial risk uh, and the skill, the sort of the level of skill, um, academic skill, as, as I've mentioned this before, uh, financial skill and manual skill involved. This is the death junction, I'm at the death junction. That, um, you know, we, can we just agree that that level of, um, of skill and risk is should be about there on the scale and they're like no we can't agree that anymore no we're not no you're gonna you're just gonna float free you're gonna float free in the free market you'll be free to earn what you like well okay so we floated and, and we are floated down you know we did float down and that's because I think that they what happened was the public sector refused to acknowledge the value you know that would I mean, you have to look at what we would earn in the private sector and since say, you know, is it the public sector, should the public sector buy dentistry in the private sector? Basically, that's what we're saying. So if a dentist, let's say, earns £100,000 in the private sector and the, and the public sector want to employ a dentist, how much should they pay? Should they pay the going rate, the market rate, or should they, should they try and get one for 80 or should they say that it, they think he only deserves 50 so they're only going to pay 50 I mean, how does it work? The way it works is that actually to within about a thousand pounds, we all earn the same. Private dentists and NHS dentists all earn 130,000 pounds a year before income tax. That's not a gross turnover of your practice, that is your profit attributable to you before you pay income tax. So, you know, and that's 10 grand a month you're trousering before tax. So that's not a bad little earner, is it? And let, let's face it, uh, you know, if I had a bunch of employees that were all trousering 130 grand a year, I wouldn't be that concerned about <laughs> giving them a massive great pay rise either. Would you? I wouldn't. 130,000 a year and, and they're complaining that they've only got a 1% pay rise. I mean, you know, but what the government doesn't understand, right? And this is like this is a real light bulb moment, I think, for them if they if they ever really do realise that. And that is that when they they do this one percent, this one percent is like Ken Weech was an old uh, was an advisor to the Dental Practitioners Association. He was an old uh, leftist Labour MP for Ipswich, and we hired him as a parliamentary consultant for a while. He's a lovely guy. He used to turn up at the Ariel Hotel every Sunday and sit there quite patiently, and we used to bung him a few grand a year which is how MPs made money, you know, in those days they used to just get a bit of money here and there. And he quite liked the GDPA because he just kept trying to get us to join the trade union, so, uh, trade union co conference and all that because we were all a bit uh, Bolshe, you know, <laughs> in the sort of argumentative sense, not the Bolshevik sense. And uh, he said, um, oh God, 
something, this must have been in 1980 something, he said that the government's policy, he said, is very similar to the farmer who had a horse and tried to save money by feeding the horse a bit less every week. A policy which worked really well until the horse died. And, uh, you know, and he was so prescient with that. I know, I know you can look back and pick out what was prescient, and not, it wasn't necessarily prescient at the time, but basically, he had had a lot of experience in government and, and he came up with a load of other truisms such as you only, uh, you know, the government never calls an inquiry until they know what the result is going to be. <laughs> he was like, it's so cynical. I picked up all these cynics. It's all who take, uh, took all his cynicism and, and, and treasured it, you know, and it's, it's here, it's here again. Just if you're still around and watching this. <laughs> yeah, so. Where was I? Yeah, so 1%. So 1% pay cut. And, and what, well, I mean, you know, it's effectively a 1% pay cut because inflation's 2 or 3% and, and they're getting 1%. So, oh God, now I lost my train of thought. Right, okay, now I'm going to talk about something else <clears throat> because this is 19 minutes. It's a long time, but it's not a long time. Do you know what I mean? And that is the other, the other ridiculous thing that they've done today, which is, or yesterday or a couple of days ago, which is to sort of say, oh, we're going to take all these ridiculous, stupid medicines off the NHS prescription, uh, uh, you know, uh, out of the British National Formulary, so the doctors can't prescribe. And <clears throat> they've come up with a bunch of stuff which um, was really, uh, you know, pathetic. You know, they <laughs> and the irony of it is, okay, is that let's say, let's say for example, doctors shouldn't prescribe aspirin, okay? Now everybody can buy aspirin now, it's horrendously overpriced because, because uh, they wanna make it difficult for anyone who's gonna take an overdose to, uh, to buy enough aspirin, right? So if you wanna take an overdose, we're gonna, we're gonna force you to go around about 10 or 15 different pharmacies. I mean, aspirin's not the best way to take an overdose, but I'm not gonna tell you which drug is, but I mean, you know, you know, you've got to really thought about this. We don't want any spontaneous overdoses here, right? You know, and overdoses can be a bit spontaneous. We know that. We know what you're like, don't we? You are a bit spontaneous when you're trying to kill yourself. You know, we want you to plan it. We want you. To, we want to plan, and, and preferably a suicide note, so the coroner can be quite sure it is a suicide and that he didn't accidentally just take too many. Okay? Uh, if you could do that, that'd be great. Thank you very much. So, so now aspirin is expensive because you can only buy two in a packet. And what they're going to do, they're going to start taking all these pissant medications off the National Health Service. Now, my point to you is this, right? We used to give, we used to dispense uh, drugs, even on the National Health Service, we used to do it. It cost peanuts. You, you've got to uh, buy a few bottles, you've got to buy the drugs, which cost pennies, and uh, some screw lids. And the most difficult bit, I'll tell you, the most difficult bit is getting a bloody printer to print those tiddly little labels that are lined up properly so that, you know, so that you don't waste sheets and sheets and sheets of labels just because you've got your address off the bottom or, then, or you've forgotten to keep it out of the reach of children or whatever. But, you know, for someone who needed some penicillin or something, and in, in the old days we used to give out a lot of penicillin. Um, we, we had um, prescription pads uh, pre-printed up with with pen v scripts because uh, we had so many people in with pain that we couldn't see because we were booked up three months ahead uh, that there was no question of doing a root treatment on you know on the spot to get someone out of pain nowadays it's the opposite I do do root treatments if someone comes in with pain and it's non-vital then we always open it up we always because we've got the time now we always open it up we dress it and after a couple of days time they say yeah yeah it's going it's all getting a lot better you occasionally get the odd patient who comes in and says, don't you think I ought to have some antibiotics, right? And that's because they've come from the National Health Service where this, they've got this antibiotic culture. Uh, and not because they like antibiotics or because it works, but because it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an administrative thing, it's a bureaucratic thing. You've got to get, this, you've got to get the patient out of surgery and the easiest way to do that is to write them a prescription for antibiotics say, I'm sorry, I can't do anything, come and wait until these work, come back in five days or a week or, or preferably three months. So the patient will say, you know, should I, should I perhaps not have some antibiotics? She'll say, no, actually, what we're gonna do, we're gonna do one better than that. We're not just gonna sort of fight the symptoms, we're actually gonna deal with the problem. We're gonna get rid of the infection for you. That, you know, so you won't need the antibiotics. Oh, okay, oh, that's great, all right, so do this. Two hours later, phone call. Oh, no, Mr. Samuel again. Um, 
um, I was just having a word with my wife and she said, uh, are you quite sure that it wouldn't be a good idea because I've got an infection to give me antibiotics? Now, you know exactly what's happened, don't you? Mr. Mr. Nerd has gone home and he said, he said, oh, hello, dear. <laughs> His wife said, what have you done? Oh, I went to the dentist. I've got, I've got, he says, I've got an infection in the tooth. Oh, did he give you antibiotics? No, he said uh, he's, um, he's dealt with it directly. What? He didn't, you've got an infection and he didn't give you antibiotics? Oh, Aunt Maisie went to the dentist and she gets antibiotics every three weeks. She's got a swelling. Every time the swelling comes up, she goes and gets antibiotics. The swelling goes away again. What sort of dentist is this that doesn't give antibiotics for infection? Does he not know his job? Get on the phone, get on the phone. Tell him, just say, don't say I said it, but just say, are you sure? Just check, just remind him, because he may have forgotten. Just remind him that he might want to give you antibiotics because it's an infection. Oh. <clears throat> we used to give them away. They cost us about 20p. It, at the time, I think a prescription was about two or three quid. The patients loved it, they loved it. We didn't care, it cost us practically nothing. The biggest cost was the labour to organise it all and stick all the labels on. <clears throat> but the fact that they didn't have to go down the pharmacy, wait, struggle, queue, sit on a bucket chair, listen to two old twits discussing their arthritis and take half a day out of the day to pay four quid for something that we could we, we could and why used to say to them look you know you've got an infection I'm gonna give you something that's gonna get working on that straight away take two now we used to tip two out so take two now get right on get right on it and then take these and then finish them off oh that was they loved it and that was on the NHS privately we don't prescribe antibiotics I think I probably prescribed them one once in the last year and the stupid thing is that they they make the National Health Service money do you know what, how much is a prescription charge now what eight eight quid nine quid three hundred quid I don't know how much is it how much is a course of how much is a course of antibiotics ten pence they actually they, they, they're sawing it off earning money with these drugs that don't cost anything I mean, okay, perhaps there might be one or two that cost money, but not the ones they're banning. They're banning, they're banning the stupid stuff, the really cheap stuff, the stuff they're coining it in, prescribing, by because they insist on charging £15 for a prescription charge for something that doesn't cost them anything. Oh, but the stuff that cost them a fortune, but they only get eight quid for, they're going to carry on prescribing that. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I tell you, I still think that we ought to have a cheap, uh, a cheap uh, test for penicillin allergy because they could save the drugs budgets could <laughs> so much. The, there's an entire generation of people that are not allergic to penicillin, Pen V, that think that they are. This entire generation, we've we've built up an entire generation of people who are not resistant to Pen V. They're resistant to blue cloxacillin and what cloxacillin and uh, they've got staphylococcus uh, resistant methylacillin resistant staphylococcus aureus and all that right? but you could completely cure them with pen v because no bug has ever had it <laughs> that pen v is a miracle thing not not don't get it confused with pen one uh, pen i or pen i i or even pen i i i or the jewish penicillin pen iv that is they're no good. It's the pen V you want, but the V is always the, the good one, okay? Just bear that in mind, like the Mambo. It wasn't the number of Mambo one, two, three, or four that were the good ones, it was the five. It wasn't the, the Saturn one that was the big rocket, or the two, or the three, the four. They were all useless. It was the Saturn five. And Beethoven, well, <coughs> his third symphony was not too bad, but one and two, four, too quiet. Five, that's the one. Okay, bear that in mind. Five, the magic number. Talk to you later. Bye.